One of the most uh, beautiful and extremely beneficial surahs of the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about a wise man by the name of Luqman. Luqman al-Hakim was a black Abyssinian uh, man from Africa. He had moved to live in Yemen and he used to live uh, in the sand dunes of Arabia, of the Yemeni desert. And over there it was narrated that he was a very, very wise man. Luqman spoke to his son, and his son was uh, a young man at that time. Some of the scholars mentioned that he was on the cusp of adulthood, and the advice that he gave to his son, and how that advice became a verse of the Quran, or surahs of the Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to be recited till the Day of Judgment. Surah Luqman was revealed early on in the Makkan period, uh, and as a result, the surah deals with the topic of the Makkah period, which is the Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Alif, Lam, Mim. These are the mystical letters of the, of, of the Quran. No one knows its meaning except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Tilka ayatul kitab al hakim. These are the words or the letters of the kitab al hakim, the wise book. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already quoted that this Qur'an is wise. The reason why is because he's about to quote a wise man called Luqman al-Hakim. So lest people think that someone else had more wisdom than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the very first thing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts with the surah is with what true wisdom really is. True wisdom is to witness the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. True wisdom is to understand the reality of things, that every single thing is a servant of Allah. And that, and, and that every single thing has a master, and the master is one, and that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Tilka ayatul kitab al hakim. That is the, the signs of a book that is wise. Hudan wa rahmatan lil muhsineen. Guidance and a mercy for those who do ihsan, for those who are muhsineen. Is that you worship Allah as if you see Him. If you cannot think that you see Him, then know that at least that He sees you. Is to behave as if you are in front of Allah. What do they do? الَّذِينَ يُقِيمُونَ الصَّلَاةَ وَيُؤْتُونَ الزَّكَاةَ وَهُمْ بِالْآخِرَتِهُمْ يُقِنُونَ Those who يُقِيمُونَ الصَّلَاةَ Establish the prayer. Did you, say, did you see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never ever says those who pray. So to pray means, you know, Allahu Akbar and say your dhuhr and ask a prayer. But iqamat al-salah means not only to astray, but to give the adhan and to give the iqama and to perfect your wudu, and to ensure the places of prayer are correct, and to set the masjids up, and to ensure adhan is being given from the, from the masajid, and to upkeep the masajid where prayer is held, and to ensure that your family knows how to pray, that you know how to pray, that you keep a special place in your house for prayer. All of this is part of iqamat salah meaning establish prayer in your lives, not just pray. So they make time for, for prayer. They enjoy in prayer, they encourage prayer, they advise people to pray, they tell people off if they don't pray, they punish people if they don't pray. All of this is part of iqamat al-salah. So if I pray and I don't, in, don't order my wife to pray, or for example, I get up at Fajr and pray and then my son, my son does not pray, and I don't order my son to pray, then that is not iqamat al-salah. Alladina yuqimuna salah wa yu'tuna zakah, and they give the zakat. As you can see, this is one of 27 times in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions iqamat al-salah wa ita zakah together. It shows the relevance of the, of the two together. It is for this reason why Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu ajma'in used to consider that the person who does not pray and does not give zakat to be a kafir. Because Allah said so 27 times. If someone therefore doesn't do it, that means that that person has gone against 27 verses of the Quran. And that is why when Abu Bakr fought the people in his time who did not give him the zakat, he fought them as if they were disbelievers. وَهُمْ بِالْآخِرَتِهُمْ يُقِنُونَ Meaning they have faith and they have belief and they have fear of that day of the Akhirah. That means that it is not enough brothers and sisters to simply have belief in the heart. You must have action of the limbs as well. So simply say that I love Allah or I am a believer, I am a Muslim. 
but not to pray, but not to fast, this is not enough. Ula'ika ala hudam mir rabbihim. They are the ones who are upon guidance from their Lord. Wa ula'ika humul muflihun. They are the ones who will be successful. Wa min al nasi man yashtari lahu al hadith. And from mankind are those who are not successful people. These are people who drive the successful people away from their success. Who are these people? They are the people who are confused and they try to confuse others. Wamin and nas and from mankind, man, those who yeshtari, those who purchase, lahwal hadith, meaning false statements. You know, just like sitting around, having your tea and just talking about nothing. What are we talking about? Oh, nothing at all. Price of fish. And you're talking about filthy things or silly things that have no use or value at all. An example, lahwal hadith, is talking about people which is what we do today, which have no use at all. In order to misguide people away from the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Without knowledge at all. And they take it as a jest. You know some people, they get offended when you don't talk and have chit chat. Okay, so I'm not trying to be an hospitable guest guys, no please. Be good guests when guests do come. But please, do not be like the one who's like, yeah, come over anytime. You've got to stop the attitude where you just waste time. <laughs> For them is a disgraceful muheen, meaning a disgraceful punishment. Because the most valuable thing we have is time. ayatuna, <laughs> And when our verses are recited to him, وَلَّوْ مُسْتَكْبِرًا He turns away arrogantly. كَأَنْ لَمْ يَسْمَعْهَا As if he has never ever even heard it. كَأَنَّ فِي أُذُنَيْهِ وَقَرَى It is as if in his ears is a barrier. فَبَشِّرْهُ بِعَذَابٍ عَلِيمٍ Give him glad tidings of a terrible punishment in the hellfire. This verse is a proof that you must not ever do anything when the Qur'an is being recited except listen to the Qur'an. Meaning, don't you dare, just put the Qur'an on, wash, do, do your dishes. Don't put the Qur'an on, and then talk to your friends. Don't put the Qur'an on in your car, and just chit chat on the phone. And when the Qur'an is recited, then pay attention to it, listen to it attentively. Perhaps you may be, Allah may have mercy on you. In the same way, brothers and sisters, it is haram to leave the masjid after adhan. So if you happen to be in the masjid and the adhan has been given, you cannot leave the masjid unless you want to make wudu to come back and pray. Because وَإِذَا تُتْلَ عَلَيْهِ آيَاتُنَا وَاللَّهُ مُسْتَكْبِرًا كَأَلَّمْ يَسْمَعْهَا Does that make sense? As if he didn't even hear it, and what he heard is of no consequence. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ لَهُمْ جَنَّاتُ النَّعِيمِ As for those who believe in Allah and do righteous deeds, that this combination comes again and again in the Quran, Hundreds of times. Amanu wa aminu salihat. Knowledge and action, knowledge and action, knowledge and action. Both of them must happen together. For them is the Jannah, which is the most blessed of Jinan, blessed of Jannahs. Khalidina fiha, they will reside therein forever. Wa'adallahi haqqa, the promise of Allah, which is truthful, meaning that they will reside therein forever. So let no one ever think that anyone will ever leave Jannah. وَهُوَ الْعَزِيزُ الْحَكِيمُ And he is the most blessed, the most wise. Now, here's the important point. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that they will reside therein forever. What about Jahannam? Will people in Jahannam reside therein forever? Answer is yes and no. Yes, meaning those who disbelieve in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, die upon pure disbelief, they will dwell therein for, in Jahannam forever. So, which uh, part of Jahannam will people come out of eventually or it will extinguish that is the part where people who are Muslimin that have entered Jahannam when they are taken out that is the part of Jahannam that will be extinguished he created the heavens without any pillars that you can see and he threw into the earth Rawasiya meaning mountains like stakes in the ground. And antami dabikum, lest the earth also moves along with you. Meaning, lest 
there is far too much movement on the crust of the earth and no stability. Less that happens, Allah has put stakes in the ground in order to give it stability. What are those stakes? Mountains. In fact, we find that the mountains, as high as they are, are equally longer as they go down into the earth as well. وَأَلْقَى فِي الْأَرْضِ رَوَاسِيَ أَن تَمِيدَ بِكُمْ وَبَثَّ فِيهَا مِنْ كُلِّ الدَّابَّ And He has sent on this earth every single walking creature. وَأَنزَلْنَا مِنَ السَّمَاءِ مَاءً And we have sent down from the heavens water. فَأَنبَتْنَا فِيهَا مِنْ كُلِّ زَوْجٍ كَرِيمٍ And so we caused therein from the water to come out fruits and plantations and animals of Two, two kinds, meaning the male and female, from every single type of species. Hada khalqullah. This is the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Fa'aruni mada khalaqalladina min duni. Then show me what have all those other people, other gods created other than Allah. What have these Lat and Manat and Uzza and Ram and Sita and all these other gods, what have they created other than Allah? Zawajal? بَلِ الظَّالِمُونَ فِي ضَلَالِ مُبِينَ Rather the ظَالِمُونَ are in utter manifest error. وَلَقَدْ آتَيْنَا لُقْمَانَ الْحِكْمَةِ Verily we gave Luqman hikmah. And that's why remember, this, this verse starts off very early on in this surah. تِلْكَ آيَاتُ الْكِتَابِ الْحَكِيمِ Remember, this is the wise book. And from the wisdom of the book is that Allah has mentioned the stories of wise people like Luqman al-Hakim, right? So wisdom, the word hikmah, can mean two things. In the context of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the uh, the word al hikmah means sunnah. In the context of of gener generalization, hikmah without any specific context of this prophet, that prophet, it means tawheed. In the general context of talking about the Sharia and Allah's rulings, it means wisdom. So it has three separate meanings based upon the context in which it is being revealed. What is being referred to here? We gave Luqman Tawheed. Anishkur lillah. That you should do shukr to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What does shukr mean? This verse is very important, brothers and sisters. What does shukr mean? The hikmah that Allah gave Luqman was that he should do shukr of Allah. If you have been taught to do shukr of Allah, that means Allah has given you some hikmah. So what is, does shukr mean? Shukr means three things. Number one, it means thanking the person who has done something good to you. Number two, you have to praise that person with someone else. So you speak about that person's blessings to someone else. Number three, is that you give something back to the person, equal or better in value. If you cannot, then the best you can do. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, how few of my slaves are thankful to me. Because how do we thank Allah? We eat, we eat, we eat. What do we do? Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah is just the first part. There's two more left. You need to now go back and tell somebody how amazing was that food? How much did Allah give us? How much more does Allah give us without even asking, without even deserving? The third part, what are we going to do for Him? So let's memorize the whole Quran for his sake. Let's go for Umrah for his sake. Let's give money uh, to the poor for his sake. Let's build a masjid for his sake. Let's... Does that make sense? This is how you do shukr. وَمَا يَشْكُرْ And whoever does shukr, فَإِنَّمَا يَشْكُرُ لِنَفْسِهِ Then he is actually doing shukr for himself. Why does Allah say that? Because Allah has chosen two names for himself. الشَّكُور and الشَّاكِر الشَّكُور is the one who exaggerates in his shukr. A shakir, the one who is constantly thank, thanking all the time. So the little that we do for Allah, like subhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a shakir, he's constantly thanking us back for doing that little bit of good deed to Allah. So he's a shakir, the one who is constantly thankful, the constantly thankful God. That's why Allah continues to provide for us, even when we are negligent and even when we sin. The second thing is that Allah has chosen for himself shakur, the one who is excessively thankful, we give him nothing and he gives us Jannah. Waman kafara, that whoever disbelieves, fa inna Allah ghaniyun hamid, that indeed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is rich, free of all wants. Hamid, the one who is praised, all praiseworthy, 
it doesn't matter whether you praise him or not, he's already praised by others. وَإِذْ قَالَ لُقْمَانُ لِإِبْنِهِ And when Luqman said to his son, وَهُوَ يَعِذُهُ And he is giving him a good command. Ya khwati, this is a very important verse. When do we give our children mawidah? One of the best that I've come across is the statement of Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu who said for the first seven years, play with them. And then the next seven years, teach them. And then the next seven years, be their friend. What advice do we give our children? Have we ever told our children to worship Allah and not do shirk? Look at this Luqman al-Hakim. The first thing he told his son, لا تشرك بالله Never ever commit shirk with Allah. Inna shirka, verily the shirk is ظلمٌ عظيم is a grave sin, is a grave sin. This is important because this is the first reason Allah sent, uh, sent messengers to mankind. We had sent to every single nation a warner, a messenger, that they should worship Allah and to stay away from the taghut. So this is the first thing every parent has to advise his children. Why? Because every other sin Allah can forgive. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never ever forgive shirk. Shirk can happen in three things. Shirk can happen in rububiyyah. Like for example, you obey your mom above your obedience to Allah. Or you obey your school or your job in disobedience to Allah. Like for example, job says no problem. We'll give you this job but you have to shave your beard. We'll give you this job but you have to take your hijab off. Then there's shirk in uluhiyah. is to do shirk with Allah in his worship. For example, you worship another god other than him. Or you consider that someone else has one of his attributes that only belongs to Allah Zawajal. Like you think, for example, this pious man in the grave, for example, can hear you. Shirk can also happen in Allah's names and attributes. For example, to disbelieve that there is even a God, or to disbelieve in the existence of God, or to call God Mother Nature, or to call it the engineer of creation. Those names which Allah has never given is also shirk in Asma Sifat. And we have ordered mankind to be good to his parents. Right after Tawheed, Allah mentions parents. Because the haqq of the parents comes right after the haqq of Allah Azawajal. If you make your mother angry or your father angry, your parents angry, it may be Allah will drive you to kufr. Hamalathu ummuhu. His mother bore him, meaning carried him in her tummy. Wahnan ala wahn. Pain and suffering and distress upon pain and suffering and distress. What is the pain and suffering? The pain and suffering is the weight. The pain and suffering, she can't even breathe properly, she can't eat properly. The pain and suffering is that how many times due to this, she has to lose her nutrients in her body, her tooth becomes brittle, she has extreme vomiting feeling. She cannot tolerate many things. She cannot eat many things anymore. All of this because of this tummy. The first wahan bini, meaning the carrying of the baby in the tummy. The second wahan bini, the delivery of the baby and the pain and suffering that they go through. Wafisaluhu fi amain. Fisaluhu meaning and breastfeeding and weaning from the breastfeeding is after two years. Therefore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has recommended in this verse that breastfeeding be done for two years. Anishkur li, that you should thank me, wali wali deika, and your parents. If we have our parents alive, then we have great. If they're not alive, then we can still be good to them. How? By making dua for them. Because a person will be asked to go to Jannah. When he goes to Jannah, every time he goes to Jannah, Allah will tell him, go to the next level. Next level. This is authentic hadith in Bukhari. Every time he goes to another level, next level. So the man will say, Ya, ya Allah, why are you telling me to go to next level, next level? My deeds are not good enough for all of this. So Allah will tell him, this is because of the dua of your son for you. You've got to teach your children to make dua for you. You have to make dua for your parents, even if they're alive or they passed away. Because Allah will save them. So be of those people, ikhwati, who do good to your parents, whether they're dead or they're alive. The second way you can be good to them after being dua to them, do something for them that they will continue to benefit. Like build a masjid, look after orphans, even build a well from which people can drink water. Perhaps Allah will give them water to drink on the day of judgment. Number three, 
is to be good to those people that they used to love in this dunya. Like their families, like their friends. Anishkur li wa li walidayka ilayya al-masir. To me is your return. Wa in jahadaka. Now Allah subhanahu wa says that though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordained that you be good to parents, if the parents do the opposite of what they're meant to do, meaning instead of being good to you, they actually are bad to you, or the worst or bad that a parent can ever be to the child is what? Is actually order the child to worship any other gods other than Allah, جل, which is to order them to do shirk. And if they order you to do that which they have no knowledge of and that which you have knowledge of, then do not obey them. Meaning that you cannot let your love for your parents overcome the love of Allah. That Allah will leave you to the love that you have chosen other than Allah. And meaning if they force you, fight you to disobey Allah, then do not obey them. But Allah doesn't allow you to fight them back. What does Allah say? فَلَا تُطِعْهُمَا Don't obey them. وَصَاحِبْهُمَا فِي الدُّنْيَا معروفة. And be with them in this dunya in goodness and kindness. That even if they fight you, even then you cannot fight them back. وَاتَّبِعْ سَبِيلَ مَنْ أَنَابَ إِلَيْهِ And follow the path of those who do, those who turn to me. Anaba means two things. Number one, he repents. And number two, he glorifies Allah. Whilst thinking that he is a very poor person and bankrupt. So if you think that you're bankrupt, have no deeds in front of Allah, and you repent to Allah, then you have done anaba to Allah. What tabi' meaning follow the sabil, the path of those who repented to me. Thumma ilayya marji'ukum faunabbi'ukum bima kuntum ta'amaloon. Thumma thereafter ilayya to me. Marji'ukum is your return. Faunabbi'ukum, then I will tell you. Bima kuntum with what you used to ta'amaloon, with what you used to do in this dunya. Moving on, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya Bunayya, my beloved loving son. So it's a way of showing that when you give advice to somebody, open up the word of advice with a word of love. Perhaps that the, it might make it easy for the person accepting the advice to accept the advice. Luqman said, Ya Bunayya, O oh my son, Innaha intaku mithqal habbatin min khardarin. Innaha, verily if there is, Intaku, if there was, Mithqal, like the example of a atom's weight, Mithqal habbatin, so a very tiny seed, Min khardalin, from mustard grain, by way of saying the tiniest of things. Fa innaha intaku mithqal habbatin min khardalin, Fatakuna fi sakhra, so this little grain, this small one atom's weight of tiny thing, it's actually inside a whole mountain. It's inside a brick. فَتَكُونُ فِي sahra أَوْ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ Or in the heavens. أَوْ فِي الْأَرْضِ Or in the earth. يَأْتِ بِهَا Allah. Allah knows where it is. Allah will bring it out. So after Luqman tells his son to not commit shirk with Allah, then tells him to be good to his parents, what is the third thing Luqman told his son to be? Is to inculcate in his heart taqwa, fear of Allah Azawajal. Because if Allah can bring out even an atom's weight of good or bad inside a big rock or in the heavens or in the earth, that means you cannot do a single deed that can ever be hidden from Allah. Allah will bring it out on the day of judgment. Inna Allah latifun khabir. Meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is completely aware of every single secret. The next thing he tells his son, Ya Bunayya aqim as salah. Oh my son, establish the prayer. So after taqwa comes salah. Or the necessary condition of having taqwa in the heart is that Luqman told his son, you must establish the salah. Wa mur bil ma'roof. After establishing the prayer, what's the fifth thing that he tells his son to do? Command the good. Munkar, and forbid people from that which is wrong and be patient with that which befalls you. This is a very important verse. After taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Luqman al-Hakim told him the most important way of preserving taqwa of Allah is salah. 
Because you see, salah is a light from Allah Azawajal. It is something that stops us from sinning. And it is something that helps us to forgive the sins that we have incurred in this dunya. Salah is the greatest link that we have with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the authentic hadith, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said in Mustad Imam Ahmed, that when someone prays, the angels put their sins on their shoulders and on their head. And when they do ruku, then some of the sins fall off. And when they do sujood, all the sins fall off. Salah is a cleanser of our sins. It is a means of reconnecting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And remember, he didn't say pray. Rather, he said, Aqim is salah, meaning establish the prayer. Aqim is salah, wa'mur bil ma'roof, and command the good, wanhaan il munkar, and forbid against the evil. Ikhwati, this is something which is missing in our community today. In our community, we do not command the good, we do not forbid the evil. We tell people when someone comes and tells you, Akhi, don't smoke. What do we tell them? Lakum deenukum wal yadeen. But Ikhwati, Lakum deenukum wal yadeen was not revealed for Muslimin. Lakum deenukum wal yadeen was revealed for kuffar who rejected the hidayah and they didn't want to listen at all. Finally, Allah tells them, Lakum deenukum wal yadeen. But for Muslimin, this verse doesn't apply. For Muslimin, your deen is my deen. My deen is your deen. For Muslimin, you have to tell them what is right. And you have to tell them to stay away from what is wrong. So for every single Muslim, you have to say, Akhi, by the way, smoking is not something which is, which is Islamic. Do you know if you smoke, angels don't come to your house? Brothers, don't do this. Stay away from women. Stay away from speaking to women that are not halal for you. So Ikhwati, if today we see people doing sins, and we do not go out and tell them, in the authentic hadith, which is in Sahih Muslim, it is reported that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Jibreel alayhi salatu salam to a town to destroy the town. So Jibreel went to destroy the town. Before he destroyed the town, he came back to Allah again. He said, Ya Rabb, but there is a righteous person in that town. So Allah said, begin with him. Why? An nawawi rahimahullah, he said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, said to Jibreel to begin with him because this man never used to command the good, forbid the evil. Wasbir ala ma asabak. Meaning when you command the good, forbid the evil, then people will not like you. Because no one likes anyone who tells you to do right or wrong. Be patient even if people reject you. Look at Rasulullah When he told people to do good, forbid the evil, they pelted him, they called him names. Inna dhalika min azmi al-umur. He tells his son, verily patience is from the highest of affairs, the most difficult of things to have, but the most blessed and most highest of upright character that you should build within yourselves. Sabr is to have good thoughts about Allah. So if you have, for example, poverty, you end up having bad thoughts about Allah. What is a bad thought? Oh, if I, if I don't have money, how am I going to pay my rent? Oh, how am I going to live? How am I going to feed my kids? This is you having bad thoughts about Allah. But sabr is to have good thoughts about Allah. No, Ya Rabb, I know you're giving me poverty because you want my re reward to increase. Oh Allah, you're going to make me a stronger person. Allah, you're giving me difficulty in this dunya because you're going to increase my reward in the akhirah. Oh Allah, you're giving me difficulty now so that I can be stronger for more difficulty in the future. This is what sabr really is. Sabr is to have good thoughts about Allah. Have good thoughts about Allah when Allah gives you disease. When Allah gives you blindness. Or Allah gives you cancer. Sabr, sabr is something Allah loves. <coughs> Meaning never ever turn your faces away from people. Meaning when people speak to you, always look at them and give them attention. Wallahi, this is such an amazing thing. Nor turn your faces away from people when they're asking you for something. Look to them, speak to them, give them the full attention. And subhanAllah, this is what Luqman is telling his son. Meaning, do not turn your faces away because they will think you're arrogant or that you don't care. The person will think, I am not important for you to even listen to me. So do not, do not turn your faces away from people arrogantly. Wala tamshi fil ardi maraha. So instead of telling him, don't have pride, he's telling him, don't do those actions that show that you have pride. A better way to teach people is to tell them to avoid deeds that they do 
when they are angry or when they are arrogant. Do you understand what I'm saying? The way you walk shows how you behave with mankind. Don't lead your life in a proudful manner. Don't speak in a proudful manner. Do not behave in a manner which boasts and shows arrogance to others. Inna Allah, verily Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, la yuhibbu, he does not love kulla, every single mukhtalin fakhur, boastful, arrogant human being. Sometimes we become self-amazed. Wow, look at me now. It happens after you graduate from university. It happens after you get a big job. It happens after you make a lot of money. It happens after you buy a big car. It happens to people sometimes. Wow, look at me now, attitude. Ikhwati, always be humble. Waqsud fi mashik. Meaning, it's amazing. This man, Luqman al-Hakim, is so wise that he does not tell his son about qualities of how to be, but tells him how to behave in a particular way. Do not take big gates in your walk, nor take small gates in your walk. Walk in a most gentle manner. How did Rasulullah walk? The Prophet used to take strides, small strides, not big ones, small ones, but he used to walk very, very fast. Waghdud min sawtik. And watch the tone of your voice and watch the volume of your voice. So the way you modulate your voice is the biggest impact in the way people understand the words. And the biggest impact in the emotion is through the modulation of the voice. Inna ankar al-aswati la sawtul hamid. The worst of voices or sounds is the brain of the donkey. The scholars of Islam said the donkey brays at the wrong time. It brays with a high pitch and it brays with a high tone. So watch your pitch, watch your tone, watch the volume of your speech and people will end up thinking highly of you. Can you imagine how wise is this man? Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala moves on, comes back to the original topic for which this surah was revealed which is the topic of Tawheed and gives numerous examples, numerous arguments about the topic of Tawheed and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is and has the full right to be obeyed for many reasons, not just the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one true worthy deity, but also that Allah has knowledge of things that we have no knowledge of. And also because that when someone is tested with the fitna and with a test in their life, they will notice whether he is a Muslim or non-Muslim, whether he is an atheist or he is a theist, meaning he believes in some God or the other. There is no one who goes through some serious test in their life except that he will believe in God at one point in his life. So let's carry on with Surah Luqman with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Alam tara anna Allah sakhara lakum ma fi samawati wa ma fi al-ardi Alam tara, have you not seen Anna Allah, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Sakhara lakum, has made every single thing for you on this earth and the heavens Wa ma fi al-ard and on the earth Wa asbaga alaykum ni'mahu zahiratan wa batina Have you not seen how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created for you every single thing on the heavens and the earth and on top of that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you blessings that is hidden as well as that is apparent. Ya'ikhwati, this verse shows that every single thing in this dunya has been created to help human beings and Muslimin to worship Allah Azzawajal. So why were the animals created? The animals were created for us. Why were the plants created? The plants were created for us. As long as we're not wasting the natural resources of Allah Azzawajal, if that is not the case, then indeed Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has made it possible for us to benefit from every single thing on the heavens and the earth because that is what Allah has created them for. But despite this, from mankind are those who yujadilu, meaning argue fillah about Allah bighayri ilmin without knowledge, wala hudan, wala nor uh, guidance, wala kitab mubin, nor any sort of manifest book that that they have studied or learned from. Meaning, despite the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it very apparent that every single thing in the world to help believers to worship Allah azawajal, despite this, people do not acknowledge the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and 
despite this, they, they come to the point of even arguing. Why do they argue? They argue because they do not recognize the truth. And as a result, they are blinded to the truth. And as a result, they argue. وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمُ اتَّبِعُوا مَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ And when it is said to them, meaning the argumentation is to a level, the arrogance is to a level, that when it is said to them, وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ اتَّبِعُوا مَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ Follow that which Allah has revealed. قَالُوا They will say, بَلْ نَتَّبِعُوا مَا وَجَدْنَا عَلَيْهِ آبَاءَنَا They will end up saying that, no, rather we would follow what our forefathers taught us, rather than what Allah has revealed. And Ikhwati, this is a very important verse. Because this goes back to what, what we do and how we behave today as Muslimin. As Muslimin, are we are of those people who reject the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ for what we think is what our Imams have said or what our uh, religions have said, for example, forefathers have said, or are we the ones who will come to a verse of the Quran that apparently clearly invalidates one of the practices that we do now and then take the Quran above our own practices? Or are we the ones who today will invalidate the Quran or try to understand the Quran with our own practices. And so both of these things must be taken into account because at the end of the day, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala over here <coughs> tells us that this is from the ways of the disbelievers, that they tend to follow their forefathers above the clear text of the Quran and Sunnah. Meaning Allah says, will they continue to do this? Meaning follow the forefathers? even if it is the shaitan that is guiding them to the terrible punishment. Meaning the way shaitan comes and says, look, I'm shaitan, follow me. That would be stupid. But the shaitan comes in the form of presentable things. Sometimes shaitan comes in the form of our forefathers and tells you to follow that rather than anything else. And, and, and a perfect example I can give you is what Ibn Qayyim rahimullah says is how shaitan sometimes tells you to do good but he only orders human beings to do good in order to take him away from something even better when it's time for taraweeh prayer for example the shaitan comes to you and says don't go for taraweeh why don't you read the quran why because taraweeh prayer at the time of taraweeh is more rewarding than reading the quran on its own so as a result shaitan what he will try to do is if he cannot take you to jahannam straight away he will at least take you to a reduced level of Jannah. He will do whatever possible to harm us in whichever way possible. As a result, shaitan sometimes comes in the form of our forefathers and says, rather you're my child, you should be following what I am upon. This is one of the ways the shaitan manifests himself within us. وَمَا يُسْلِمْ وَجْهَهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ As for the one who does not follow his forefathers, as for the one who recognizes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his oneness. As for the one, my yuslim, yuslim meaning submits wajhahu, his face ilallah to Allah. When you submit your face to Allah, this means two things. Number one, to actually prostrate to Allah. <clears throat> Other scholars said no. This means that he has actually taken a path towards Islam and he has left a path towards disbelief. Wahuwa muhsinun meaning and he is a good doer. فَقَدْ اسْتَمْسَكَ بِالْعُرْوَةِ الْوُثْقَى Then he has truly taken the strongest hold. Ikhwati, this is a very important verse because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that you have to do two things in order to firm your grip on Islam. What are those two things? Number one, full submission. And number two, being that you must also be a muhsin, meaning you do good deeds whilst you think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is seeing you or that if you cannot think Allah is in front of you that at least Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is seeing you. The scholars explain فَقَدْ اسْتَمْسَكَ بِالْعُرْوَةِ الْوُثْقَى to mean that he has the firmest grip on Islam meaning on the day of judgment when he walks in the sirat his grip on the sirat is the strongest. Or other scholars mentioned that this is a metaphor to mean that he is holding on to Islam in the strongest way and that he has the best grip where he will not, not slip. الْأُمُورِ And to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the end of all affairs. As for the one who disbelieves, 
فَلَا يَحْزُنْكَ كُفْرُهُ Meaning, as for the one who disbelieves, then let not his disbelief make you sad. This verse was revealed to a man whose heart was very, very soft. Rasulullah Do you know how gentle he was? Do you know how much he loved human beings? Do you know how desperately he wanted people to believe? I didn't truly understand until I came across the following verse in the Quran. And this verse I'm about to tell you completely changed my impression of how much Rasulullah wanted people to believe and how much he loved human beings. To us is your return. And then thereafter we will inform them of what they used to do in this dunya. Inna Allah alimun sudur. Verily Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is aware of what the chests conceal. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His knowledge is closer to us than even our own jugular veins. qalila. We are going to leave him alone. We are only going to give him respite for a little while. Thumma naptarruhum ila adabin ghali. Then thereafter we will drive him towards the terrible strong punishment which is in Jahannam. Numatti'uhum qalila ya ikhwati means in this dunya. We only seem to find punishment and adab and difficulty upon the Muslim ummah. We don't seem to find this adab and punishment upon anything else from the disbelieving nations. What are we saying? Non-Muslim ummah is also not sinning? Of course they are. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Numatti'uhum qalila. We are going to give them respite for a little while. And these are the guys who have not accepted Hidayah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them respite for a little while. Then we will force them into Adab bin Ghalid, into a terrible punishment, which is in the Qabr as well as in the Akhirah. Very important. Because, Yaqwani, this verse is going to change your understanding of the meaning of La ilaha illallah. This verse says, Ya Muhammad Sallallahu if you were to ask the non-Muslims of Quraysh, who has created the heavens and the earth? They never ever disbelieved that Allah was the creator of the heavens and the earth. They always knew that creator of the heavens and the earth was always Allah Azzawajal. But the problem with them was that they used to associate partners with Allah in other than that. So for example, today we find in the Muslim Ummah sometimes people will go to graves and they will touch the graves and they will call to the graves and say, oh, so and so. There's nothing wrong with going to the graves to remind you of the Akhirah. There's nothing wrong going to the graves to make dua for the person in the grave. But there is something wrong in going to the graves and saying, okay, I'm going to get some barakah from this. Or I've got cancer, it's going to be cured. Or I am unable to have a, have a child, so I'll, I'll end up having a child. Or I need wealth and I'm going to end up having wealth. This is not the reason for which people should go to graves. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about how great a Lord He really is. How great is Allah azawajal in truth. He says, وَلَوْ أَنَّ مَا فِي الْأَرْضِ مِنْ شَجَرَةٍ And if the dunya, the world was full of trees, and the trees were actually pens, وَالْبَحْرُ يَمُدُّ مِنْ بَعْدِهِ سَبْعَةُ أَبْهُرٍ and the oceans beyond this level of ocean that we have, which is 70-80% of this earth is covered in water. Beyond this is another seven oceans like it, massive oceans of water. And they were not only just water, they were actually ink. Ma nafida kalimatullah, meaning it would not decrease how many commands Allah has in His creation. What does it mean? Meaning, Yehuti, every single day, he is giving life to somebody, he is giving death to someone. He is curing someone or he is giving disease to someone. He is forgiving someone or he is punishing someone, right? He is helping someone or he is destroying someone, right? He is raising someone or he is humiliating others. And all of these actions, and these are all simply commands. Kun fayakun. Be, and it is. Meaning, look at how Allah is intimately involved in His creation. Not like as Aristotle said, for example, that he is the first one who touched the first domino and then he doesn't get involved in the world at all. Rather, he is intimately involved. Nothing happens 
except Allah willing it. In fact, Allah says in the Quran, this is very important guys. Allah has created you and whatever you do. مَا خَلْقُكُمْ وَلَا بَعْثُكُمْ إِلَّا كَنَفْسٍ وَاحِدًا Your creation and your resurrection is nothing except the same thing. Meaning, we created you from nothing in the same way we will also recreate you from nothing as well. And we created you from the clot of blood. And here we will recreate you from that dirt in which you have been mixed into. Inna Allah Sami'un Basir. Very Allah Azza wa Jal is all Sami' the all hearing and Basir the all seeing. Alam tara anna Allah yuliju layla fi nahar wa yuliju nahar fi layl. Have you not seen that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He mixes the night into the day and He mixes the day into the night. وَسَخَّرَ الشَّمْسَ وَالْقَمَرِ And He has created the sun and the moon in their natural paths. كُلُّ يَجْرِي إِلَىٰ أَجَلٍ مُسَمَّى Every single thing continues on until an appointed time. وَأَنَّ اللَّهَ بِمَا تَعْمَلُونَ خَبِيرٌ And Allah is most aware of what you do. What is Allah mentioning here? In the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the disbelievers, why don't you worship me? But the way Allah does it, and the way Allah convinces that He is the one who has a right to be obeyed, and the right to be worshipped, is by mentioning His ayat. So, for example, you know, today, how do you prove the existence of Allah? Four ways to prove to them Allah exists. Were they created out of nothing? Suddenly, did they just come into existence or did they create themselves? If you suddenly, spontaneously came into existence, then how is there so much order and so much life and so much of the same type of life happening? Why isn't there disorder in creation? Rather, we find order in creation. This is the first point. The second one is the ayat of Allah. The sun, the moon, the stars. The third evidence are the stories of the prophets. All of them end up saying the same thing. Worship only one God, one God, one God. Even Jesus Christ never ever said, worship me. So we find every prophet of God coming with the same message. So the stories of the prophets of God are a witness. And that is why Ibn Hazm rahimahullah says that if we did not have the Quran and we never had anything except the Sunnah or the Seerah, this would have been enough for us to believe in the Islam. Because just the story of the prophets of God show that Allah must be true. Number four is by telling every single person to look into his own heart. Because every single person is born upon fitrah. Fitrah means the ability to recognize Allah. Fitrah does not mean Islam. Every child has an ability to recognize Islam. Even if non-Muslims don't believe in God, they have the ability to recognize the oneness of God. When does it show? Such as they're about to die or they're about to be shipwrecked. At that time, they find their hearts pointing towards Allah and asking Allah. So these are the four evidences. That is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the truth. And that which they call upon other than Allah is falsehood. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most high, the great. Alam tara anna al fulka tajri fil bahar. Have you not seen how the fulk? Fulk means a ship. Tajri, meaning it floats, fil bahar, on top of the ocean. Bi ni'matillah, upon the blessings of Allah. Li yuriyakum min ayati, so that he may show you from his signs. Inna fi thalika, verily in this, la ayatil li kulli sabbari shakur, are signs for every single sabbar, meaning every slave of Allah who is patient. Shakur, meaning every single patient, thankful slave of Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَإِذَا غَشْيَهُمْ مَوْجُنْ Now look how Allah Azzawajal tells us again when the true fitrah comes out and when the waves have covered themselves up layers upon layers. So the waves have come about to destroy them in the ships that they are there. كَالْظُّلَلْ 
just like the clouds have come on top of each other. Due to the extreme fear that they have, they call upon Allah, Mukhlisin, being sincere to Him, Lahuddin, making the religion only for Him. Falamma najjahum, and then when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saves them, why does Allah save them by the way? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts the dua of anyone, Muslim or non-Muslim, as long as it is Mukhlis. فَإِذَا نَجَّاهُمْ إِلَى الْبَرِّ فَمِنْهُمْ مُقْتَسِدْ So when he saves them to the land, some of them are only moderate in their worship of me. This verse is a proof that no Muslim can simply be a moderate Muslim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is angry with them that after he has saved them, when they're about to be drowned, how dare you just be moderate in my worship? وَمَا يَجْحَدُ بِآيَاتِنَا إِلَّا كُلُّ خَتَّارٍ كَفُورٍ And indeed no one does to arrogantly deny my signs except for every single arrogant sinful transgressor. يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسِ O mankind, اِتَّقُوا رَبَّكُمْ Fear your Lord. وَخْشَوْ يَوْمًا لَا يَجْزِي وَالِدٌ عَنْ وَلَدِهِ Fear the day in which a father cannot save his son, nor can a child save their parents. وَلَا مَوْلُودٌ هُوَ جَازٍ عَنْ وَالِدِهِ شَيْئًا Nor can an infant or a child ever save his parents. إِنَّ وَعَدَ اللَّهِ حَقٍّ Verily the promise of Allah is true, meaning the day of judgment will come, in which every single person will have to judge for his own actions. I cannot answer for my children, my children will never answer for me. We will do anything for our children. But the funny thing is, or the sad thing is, the same children will run away from us in the day of judgment. So why in the world will we do anything for our children? Rather we should be anything for Allah. And only some things for our children. فَلَا تَغُرَّنَّكُمُ الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا So not, do not let the life of this dunya fool you. The fool is the one who sees his life is very comfortable and he thinks that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will also give him a comfortable life when he reaches him. Rather the wise man is the one who when he sees his life is full of comfort, then he becomes afraid. So the scholars of Islam say when you have comfort, you should worship Allah through fear. And when you have difficulty, then you should worship Allah through hope. وَلَا يَغُرَّنَّكُمْ بِاللَّهِ الْغَرُورِ And do not ever, ever, th ever think a wrong thought about Allah. What does it mean, wrong thought about Allah? Do not think that because you have blessings in this dunya, it means Allah loves you. Rather, always be afraid that you might do something that might make Allah angry. There is a hadith of Rasulullah Sallallahu which should put fear in the hearts of every good human being. The hadith is, it may be a single word that a human being says, for which Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala destroys all his good deeds and throws him into the depths of Jahannam. But there is also the same hadith that should put the most amount of hope in your heart. Because the hadith continues and says, it may also be that a human being says a single good word, for which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala writes, writes for him acceptance and guidance and Jannah on the day that he meets him. This is why the believer's heart is always full of fear and hope. But that which propels him forward is the love of Allah. فَلَا تَغُرَّنَّكُمُ الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا وَلَا يَغُرَّنَّكُمْ بِاللَّهِ الْغَرُورِ Finally Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ends the surah by mentioning five things that only Allah has total knowledge over, nothing else. What are those five things? Inna Allah indahu ilmu sa'a. Verily with Allah is the knowledge of the last hour. No one knows it. Not even Jibreel, not even Mikail. No one knows it except Allah. The second thing only Allah knows, wa yunazzilu al-ghaytha. And he only he knows where he will send rain. Even today, meteorologists are not able to predict with a hundred percent certainty where rain will fall exactly. And that's why they always speak by way of probability. Number three, 
الْأَرْحَامِ And only Allah knows that which is in the womb. But what about ultrasound these days? And what about amniocentesis? We also know what's going on. No, we don't really. We think we do. But we are always unsure. Sometimes, how many times have you seen the doctors make mistakes? Every single test, there is a value of probability of error. Every test. There is no test that I know of in medical science, which is 100%. But here Allah is talking about 100% knowledge. No one has that except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number four, وَمَا تَدْرِي نَفْسٌ مَادَ تَكْسِبُ غَدَا And no human being knows what he will earn tomorrow, except Allah. Do you know whether your stock's gonna go up or it's gonna go down? And finally, the last one, وَمَا تَدْرِي نَفْسٌ بِأَيِّ أَرْضٍ تَمُوتِ And no one knows in which earth you will die. Subhanallah, do you know where you will die? Where you'll be buried? Only Allah knows. Allahu Akbar. These are the five types of knowledge that Allah has kept only for Himself. Which shows therefore, إِنَّ اللَّهَ عَلِيمٌ خَبِيرٌ Verily Allah is most knowledgeable, completely aware of all things. One of the things I forgot to tell you brothers and sisters was one of the reasons this surah was revealed is because the early Quraysh came to Rasulullah and said, Do you know this man called Luqman al-Hakim? Tell me what you know about him. Thinking that Rasulullah didn't know anything about him. And so Allah revealed this whole surah to tell them that Allah has full knowledge. Of the knowledge he had is what Luqman said to his son. Of the knowledge Allah has that he does not share with anyone are these five things by which he finishes this beautiful surah. Now we ask the Awana and Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.